we are here with the very first Cool Tools podcast ever, 10 years in the making. And uh, I've got uh, uh, three people with me. First, we have Cool Tools founder, Kevin Kelly. Hello. Hey, Kevin. Kevin's the author of the book, What Technology Wants, which uh, recently came out in paperback. And uh, there's a very cool iPad app for it as well. And we've also uh, got Michael Pusateri, a lifelong tinkerer, technology ronin, and former evil corporate exec. <laughs> hey, Mike. How's it going? Oh, doing great today. Good. Kevin, while I'm doing that, maybe you, you can talk. This is like the, the 10th year that Cool Tools has been happening. And I just very briefly, maybe you could just talk about uh, why you decided to... Uh, why, why you decided to do Cool Tools? Actually, Cool Tools started even before then. It was originally an email list of tools that I thought my friends would like to know about. Of course, this is a holdover from my days at the Whole Earth Catalog where we reviewed Cool Tools. So in 2000 or thereabouts, I started to send this out um, in email to various friends. And more and more friends wanted to add their friends to the list. And so I compiled a list of people that I was mailing it to. And then about 2003, uh, when blogging was sort of um, already, you know, it was already up and going, um, I decided that since I was just putting them out, I might as well just stick them on a web page somewhere. So April 2003 was when we started putting the the things on onto the web. So it's been going for 13 years actually right now. Wow. Yeah. I, I that that's been it's been a long time. Um and uh, yeah, it's great and and like you said, it it's kind of has its roots in in the whole earth catalog approach to things where it's uh it's recommendations rather than than panning things. Right. So so just to clue people on who are young and don't know the whole earth catalog, this was uh book printed on newsprint. It was oversized and it was basically user generated content. It was the web on newsprint. It was the web before there was web. People um, writing about their enthusiasm and um, sharing what they knew and what they loved and we would print that without very much um, editing in the catalogs and send it out to the readers. So it was reader, reader supported. There was no ads. Um, reader generated content and it was all enthusiasts and so it really if you go back and read the Horth catalogs you'll recognize it because you're reading the web that was printed on newsprint so I got right here in my office okay <laughs> <laughs> this has belonged to my dad and I stole it from him when I was a teenager and it's been, been a big inspiration to me the original one That's yeah well cool. this That's is exactly awesome. what cool tools is it's, a, it's the son of it's the extension of it it's exactly the same. It's actually what we wanted to do when we first started. We didn't really want to do it on newsprint. We we all imagined in our heads. We kept saying, "Well, it really kind of kind of like be some electronic version of little cards that you could kind of keep updated, and everybody else could, um, uh, you know, um, do the the research for you and add the price changes." This is what we always wanted. And so, as soon as the web came along, the Holworth catalog died because there was no reason for it. That's really cool. So the whole idea right now of, of Cool Tools and this podcast, I think, is to do another part of the, the – which we couldn't do back in the days of newsprint, which is um, to hear people's own um, passion for the various things that you're discovering it and to um, use this new medium to uh, bring in new voices – and hear about the stuff that they think is really cool and want to share with each other. And that's the entire propulsion of this whole thing is just sharing stuff that you think is cool. And um, I'm looking forward to this as the first of many. And um, we'll see what that form looks like. It's not really unclear exactly what will work best, but um, Mark is it's just a marvel of a maverick in determining, you know, kind of s figuring out these new media, so um, we'll do it together. Yeah, so yeah, this is definitely an experiment to, to see what happens. Um, all of you have been on, on Gweek, the Boing Boing podcast, where we talk about media uh, mainly, 
but some tools. So I think that it'll be a similar format, but we will really focus a lot on tools. And so, by the way, uh, we Joshua finally was able to uh, join us uh, via audio and, and, and video. Uh, just to introduce him, he's the co-author of five books, a freelance semiotic brand analyst, and the editor of the blog High Lowbrow. His most recent book, Unboard, The Essential Field Guide to Serious Fun, is for kids aged 8 to 13 and their parents. So, um, Josh, maybe we should start with you, and you can uh, tell us uh, about uh, uh, one of your uh, your picks. Uh, I thought this was interesting, the, the language of Tolkien's Middle Earth. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, one thing I really dig about cool cool tools is that it doesn't have to be the latest and the greatest. It just has to be something that you've used and love and want to share to other people. This is a great book from 1980, um, uh, which looks at Tolkien as a linguist. Um, and I think it's you know relevant again now that the Hobbit movies are coming out and kids are getting introduced to Tolkien again. And uh, I just gave this to my 15 and 12 year old um, yesterday. And this is a cop. This is a book that I had when I was their age, and I couldn't find my copy of it, so I, I bought a new one. They're still available on Amazon. And it's just a wonderful, extremely nerdy um, breakdown of you know Tolkien's uh, his grammar and the way his verbs are conjugated and uh, the, the the root meaning of his words and sort of um, where he's picking up um, some of the Elvish you know root. Uh, words from Old English and so forth, and uh, it sort of allows you to translate, you know, all of the quotations and all the names in the in the Lord of the Rings um, books. And um, you know, if you're extremely nerdy like I was when I was 15, you can start writing your own, you know, uh, poems and things in Elvish. So it's, <laughs> it's sort of a combination of a dictionary and a, a linguistic, um, you know, decoder, and it, it sh shows you how to read the runes in Tolkien and it's just, uh, it couldn't be nerdier and more awesome. I really and, like it. And was it taken from Tolkien's own writings? Because I knew that he began as a linguist. So, or was this a book that he wrote himself? Or is this no, other people going uh, back to his papers? I mean, in, in, I think in the Silmarillion and in his papers and in things that he, other things that he wrote, he kind of, you know, revealed a lot from the book. But she also, I think, had to decode, you know, do some decoding from the books herself. Um, and I think there's even within the books there's a little bit of decoding of what things mean where someone will tell you what the elvish you know meaning of this place name is or whatever. So yeah, she does a lot of the work for you. There's there's a similar book that I like that's all about it's all, it's all maps of the Middle Earth. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that Middle Earth Atlas. Mm -hmm. I think it's called. Again, it's by a map maker. Unbelievably nerdy, but really fun too. So I had once heard that uh, Tolkien started writing fiction as an excuse to put his language down on paper. Have you heard that? Do you think that's true? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And um, you know, he started developing the language. I think something like twenty years before he actually wrote the stories. And I think he was just you know he's a linguist. He had studied Old English and Norse and Latin and uh, all these languages. And he started making up his own. I think during World War I, World War One, uh, there's a famous story that he was in a trench uh, in World War One, and he. He, he had been working sort of off and on, on on inventing an Elvish language, and he looked over, he saw another guy in the trench all lit up by the glare of exploding German bombs and so forth, and that guy was writing an Elvish language also. Wow. <laughs> he, he never saw that guy again, but he realized that it was happening, and he had to hurry up and get his finished. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, great. Yeah, the, uh, the, um, the stories are basically an elaborate way to, to uh, show off his fun language inventions. Very cool. So that sounds like a good pick. Um, uh, let's move to you, Michael. You wanted to talk about the SPI, Small Personal Item Belt, which looks like a little tiny fanny pack. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I'm into kind of outside sports like cycling and running. And uh, when you're out in motion a lot, uh, having something that uh, can carry your, your phone or your ID or your money, whatever you need, so these people uh, at at Spy, uh, they made they have a whole series of products. The one I use is a is a belt. It's very uh, stretchable material. It'll hold a, a tremendous amount of stuff, and you can strap it around your waist. Um, and I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of miles out of my Spy belt to carry me on different runs. And they also have a lot of products uh, for things carrying things on your wrist or your ankle. Um, a lot of different things. So if you're physically active and you need to carry something, you're not wearing something with a lot of pockets. 
Um, uh, I, I just think they're really great. They're they're very inexpensive, and there's a variety of uses. They're they're pretty rugged. So just something if you're out and about and you need to carry some things with you uh, and you don't want it jingling around, uh, these things are great. And how does it compare to other kind of little mini belt kind of things? Because it seems like there are other varieties available. Um, are are they similar? Does it really matter which brand you have? Well, I, I think there's probably similar things to this particular kind of athletic, uh, you know, belt. Um, but the fact is that it's normally pretty small with an elastic material that is kind of stretching out. A traditional fanny pack is made of like a nylon fabric. It's a certain size, and things can bounce around in it. And the whole thing, if you're out running or riding or doing whatever, is you don't want stuff bouncing around. So it's probably not the only product that does this, but I can attest this one works pretty good and keeps your stuff uh, snug against your body when you, you don't want it jingling and bouncing. So it's that elastic fabric that's the real key then. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, the innovation is it if you can see it, it uh, it's really stretches out quite a bit. Um, um, but in its normal state is just pretty uh, pretty narrow. Cool. So um, they have a lot of different products, and we, we've just had a lot of luck with them. Great. That's a good one. So, uh, Kevin, uh, you didn't have a chance to give us a list of things, but do you have anything in mind that you, uh, that you wanted to talk about? No, I'm um, uh, in the middle of doing this book, so I have so many tools, I, didn't, I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, as Mark knows, I'm just, I'm just throwing these off. Uh, I just had something in my hand. Um, actually, uh, I just sent Mark this review. Let me see. Um, when you go to the next person, I'll grab it. So when we come back to me, I can show it off. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess it's my turn to talk about something. And the the first thing I wanted to mention is uh, a a Mac and iPhone app called Fantastical. It's a calendar application and. Um, it really is a uh, the, the best calendaring app that uh, calendar planner that I have come across before. Uh, first of all, it, it does it does a great job of replacing the the calendars that you normally find that that come with the iPhone and the calendar. Um, it it runs in the uh, the the toolbar so that you you know there's a little icon at the top of your uh, of your Macintosh window and you see a small calendar and you can just click on a date and then you can see uh, the events that are all that are happening like the, for the next week coming out it's a very mm. uh, well designed easy to use uh, it uses natural language uh, to, to schedule events it, it ha it's, it's the, the parsing seems excellent I haven't had any problem with the parsing um, it can uh, slurp up all of your Gmail calendars as well, and then it it syncs up with the iPhone app too, and it's really easy to scroll through events on your uh, on your iPhone to see what's going on. I, I think that the calendar that comes the calendar app that comes with the iPhone is is not very good. This one is really good, and I think uh, the the web app. I mean the the iPhone app is like five dollars, and then it's on sale right now at the Mac App Store for the Macintosh for $10. So you can get the whole thing for $15, which is a pretty good deal. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Josh now, and, and you can tell us about JDIP. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sharing it on my screen oh, right okay. now. Yeah, cool. Um, so Diplomacy is this board game uh, came out in 1959. It was a big favorite of, uh, of both Kennedy's and Kissinger's and uh, you know other Cold War players like that. I don't know if you guys are familiar. You guys, are, you guys, are you guys familiar with it? No. no. Yes, I, I played Diplomacy. Okay, yeah. So it's a little bit like Risk, except with, for the, the big difference that there is no there are no random elements. There's no dice and no cards. It's, so it's all about negotiation. It's it's a strategic game, not a tactical game. It's so about you, betrayal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a lot of hurt feelings happen in Diplomacy. <laughs> it's all about you can't win the game on your own. Unlike most other board games, you have to partner up with people. <gasps> And at some point, in order to win, you're going to have to betray even your closest partner, your closest ally. Oh, interesting. You want to win. So to, at each stage of the game, you're sort of partnering with other people and eventually betraying them. And uh, you know, this is all, you know, everyone knows this. And what happens is you don't take turns. Everyone plays at once. You all write down, you, you have a negotiation period between each round. 
then you all write down your moves secretly and, and you reveal them all at once and then you um, adjudicate, you figure out what happened. Did, you know, did, did, did such and such a move work? Did an invasion work? Or was it rebuffed and so forth? And I actually find um, it's a fun game, but it's actually kind of hard to play, uh, especially I, I, t I play a lot of board games with my children and their friends, and it's kind of a slow moving and a little bit complicated, the, that, that phase where you're, where you're adjudicating all the moves. It kind of takes forever and it sort of uh, takes away from the, the momentum of the game. It kind of makes you, you know, if you can imagine like risk takes long enough, diplomacy has this whole thing we have to figure out what happened every round, um, which can be quite complicated. So there's this great um, uh, online um, piece of software that you can download. I think it, I got it from uh, SourceForge, the, the source code repository. And it runs on Windows and Linux and Mac OS X, which is what I use. It's a graphical interface that I'm showing here. And it has a map and it has all the little icons on it. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this as I, as I do it, but you can, uh, you can click on a, um, a, a piece. Uh, an army in this case, and say that you want it to move to Silesia, let's say. So Munich, I want Munich to invade Silesia. And then uh, once all the orders are in, you um, you, res you resolve them and uh, find out what happened. So in this case, so you get a sort of little written thing about what happened, and you also get a new map showing um, where, all the, where all the pieces have moved since then. So I find it a really fun thing to do on its own. For example, you can just play with friends online like I'm doing through email, and one person is sort of the dungeon master of the game, or what we call the diplomancer. Uh, or you can um, actually, when I'm playing with my kids, we'll, we'll actually have the, the, we have a nice old copy of the board game, and we'll, and we'll make the moves on the board, but then we'll adjudicate using the, you know, on, using the JDIP on a laptop, and then move the pieces on the board according to the ruling of the JDIP. So I think it's a great, um, it's, I know, it's kind of fun having this high-tech piece added to an old-fashioned board game, and you kind of need both of them. So I like really that. really cool. What's this J-dip? Where does that come from? I assume that the dip is for dip diplomacy. Uh, I don't know what the J is. Okay. Maybe Java? Is it a or Java? J yeah, Java maybe, or, or Judge. Okay. And so it's, it's not a web-based thing. It's a downloadable, executable. Right, yeah. Okay. That that's, looks really great. Right, um, cool. So, uh, Here, so I, Mike... I, I, oh, I, go ahead. I, I, I got my thing, which I wanted to, oh, good. which I just told Mark about. So, so I'm realizing that what this can turn into is a kind of a show and tell. Yeah, maybe, maybe I like that. Maybe that's what we're doing here. <laughs> but anyway, so I just I just sent Mark this. If you have um, little kids, you'll know about this. This is a snack catcher. And wow, that looks what cool. It, what it is is you put your little Cheerios or other things inside, and the little fingers of the kids can get mm. in and get them, but they won't spill out, um, so you have this thing that you know they can carry around and eat their little snacks, um, but it won't spill in the back of the car seat or under the sofa or whatever. And um, there's a, a couple of models being made, but it's it's you know it's it's really cool. It's a great way to carry around your uh, goldfish. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, they can just get in there, so, and uh, it'll it'll be. Keep everything tidy and clean. That's good. That's I, think it's, a, a I could see putting like uh, uh, wood, uh, like screws or fasteners <laughs> in one of those too. You know, and if you yeah. I for guess your kids to eat, it's what for the kids to eat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's for a good one. For your robot to eat. So that's that's <laughs> called the Munchkin snack catcher. Very nice. So uh, so uh, Michael, tell us about the Crisk Bean Slicer. Right, the uh, the bean slicer is uh, for cooking, so it's a little little handheld tool like this, and uh, it's a really specific tool. You take your green beans, cut off the ends, and then you slide them through uh, the little hole, and it slices them perfectly in half. So for any of those recipes where you want the green beans to be uh, you know sautéed up and not be raw on the inside and overcooked on the outside, it's a perfect tool. It's a a single-use thing. So if your family likes string beans, I think it's well under $10 to get the crisk mm -hmm. slicer. Is it and one bean at a time? 
it's it's one bean at a time, but uh, you know there there's there's worse things you could do with your life than make food <laughs> yeah. by hand. Absolutely. So uh, I I kind of enjoy it. It's one of my things I get to do whenever uh, my wife decides we're having string beans. It's uh, use the slicer, so I, I I get to do it. So definitely, if you're a, if you're kind of a kitchen gadget kind of geek, uh, definitely a, a a neat neat gadget to have. Mm-hmm. It That's looks great. like there are more than one, like there's extra blades hanging off it and stuff. Does it also slice the ends off too? Or? At the very top, uh, mm-hmm. there's a blade at the top, so you can kind of slice, put the tip in at the top mm-hmm. and, and slice mm-hmm. it off of that way. I, I tend to just use a, a, a chef's knife for that part of it. Sure. Um, sure. Seems there a little bit like a cigar Oop, Sorry. No, my fault. Yeah, a little bit like a cigar snipper, but uh, I, I, yeah. Cool. So, and are just, there alternative versions, or um, these are all made by the? There's a no Norpro French bean slicer. How does does that? Looks well, kind I think of similar. the uh, th- this sl- slices the green bean perfectly in a horizontal, like bisecting okay. the green uh-huh. bean. So you have a long green bean. Uh, to French a bean is to kind of cut it into almost diagonal uh, slices. Okay. Uh, and um, there's recipes that call for that. It's a, it's a, right, another right. way. So I think the the French bean slicer uh, gives you that diagonal cutting action. Uh-huh. Okay, got it. That's a good one. All right, so the one I'm going to talk about is called Format Match, and it's another uh, Mac app. Sorry, I was I've I've been on like a t- talking about Mac apps this whole time, and, and I. But this one is very useful and it's free. So, what it is is it's another uh, it's another uh, application that uh, you can configure from the little toolbar at the very top of your your uh, your desktop. And when it's activated, what it does is it allows you to copy and paste things. Um, unformatted because I hate it when I like copy something and then I paste it into a document and the font is different and the color is different and everything this just strips all of that out and lets you cut and paste unformatted text and I know most applications have paste as unformatted but this way you can just do control C control V universally without having to worry about it and then you can deactivate it if you want but otherwise you just kind of set it up and then forget about it and um, man, it just is so useful for me to do it that way uh, because I'm always copying and pasting text from one application to another, and then you know, backing up and unformatting it and trying it again. So this has has completely stopped uh, me from having to do that. So it's a huge time saver and it's free. Um, if you own a Mac, I highly recommend downloading it, and I've yeah. had no problems with it. It would seem to you would think that there'd be a preference somewhere in the Mac system that would just allow you to toggle off, you know, the formats when you copy and paste it, right? Yeah, I but haven't if, come across if, that. If you, if you you need to do it Steve's way. That's that's simply the way it is with Macs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. I'll, I'll have to I'll have to get that because I do cut and paste a lot, so it's always uh, a pain. Yeah, it's a uh, good one. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. I think it's uh, it's Josh's turn. The HMDX Audio HXB four four zero cube Bluetooth <laughs> alarm clock. Yeah, uh, that's what they call it on uh, Best Buy's website. I think that the manufacturer HMDX would just like you to call it the cube uh, Bluetooth, or maybe they call it the HXB four forty. It's they need some. They have some. They need some help with branding. Uh-huh. So um, my wife really wanted a a new alarm clock that um that would had a dimmer on it it was very important to her she the she has the alarm clock right next to her bed at night and the light and the light shines in her eyes and uh she felt she believed this was keeping her awake i don't know if it really was but she really wanted an alarm clock with a dimmer and i wanted an alarm clock that you could play music on not just radio but um, you know, plug plug your uh, iPhone or iPod into, or another um, music source, or or you know, best of all, if you could um, wirelessly stream music through this device from your Mac or from or your iPhone or wherever, any Bluetooth enabled device. And uh, I did a lot of looking around um, to find one. I, you know, there, and there's some ones that have, supposedly have really good sound that were you know $100 or more, but I was more in the maybe $55 range. 
And uh, this one got good reviews on Amazon, so I decided to check it out. Um, it goes for 80 bucks, but Amazon's selling it for 55 So we got it, and uh, so far, so good. Um, it does indeed dim the numbers, uh, the, the screen at night. And you can listen to you know, your Amazon Cloud or your Spotify by streaming it from your devices through there. I think the, for what it is, the audio quality is pretty good. It's not amazing, but it's pretty good. You can, uh, it has a USB port, so you can charge devices on it. Um, and it has an auxiliary jack, so you can plug in you know, other audio devices. So uh, we're pretty happy with it. It's got a nice gradual wake-up function, too, which, which I've never had that before. And that's a nicer way to wake up in the morning than the, than the full-on alarm. And do you set it with Bluetooth as well, or do you have to set it from the uh, cube? The alarm? Well, setting the time. Yeah, setting the time for yeah, the alarm. Yeah, you have to do that through the cube, and you actually can't set it to play. Um, you know, your your Bluetooth enabled device in the morning. It, it'll it'll play something plugged in, or it'll play the radio. Actually, I think it'll only play the radio or the alarm, as far as I can figure out so far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but you know, when you're in your room chilling out, you can play music through it. Great. It's kind of like a jam box crossed with a traditional alarm clock. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Good. That's a cool yeah. one. So let's see. Uh, so I have, next, oh, yeah, Kevin. I have something, which was, this is something that was reviewed in Cool Tools before. I just happened to have one in my office because I'm trying to build a rack for them, but, but they really are great. It actually, this actually came out of a comment in Cool Tools uh, that we elevated later on. But but this is um, I, don't have, I still have the label on. But this is the your uh, organizational sort bot, and uh, it was prompted by a, uh, Adam Savage reviewing this very expensive German version of these things, um, and he had a in a nice rack. But they're um, what's cool about them is that. They close very secretly, but inside all the little trays can be rearranged. And you mm. can put bigger ones or smaller ones so you have your own kind of set. And they close very uh, tightly so that you can turn them upside down and move them around. And, of course, they're clear so you can see what's inside. But the main thing is you can take the little trays out and move that tray to the, to where you're working. Oh, that's Instead great. Instead of having to move the whole box. You just do. oh, I need this screw. You take this little box out here and... Um, you you take that to your workplace and um, and then if you want you know you can do, reshuffle these around to uh, make it the size you want so um, and these but these are like one sixth or one tenth of the cost of the ones that were in Germans these are just Stanley ones Home Depot have them Amazon has them so um, they're you know they're really a great thing so I'm making a rack of these. Um, for, for my workshop. I've been looking around for like this for a long time and here they are. What kind They're of good. stuff are you going to keep in it? Well, you know, it's um, all your little parts. You know, your nuts mm -hmm. and bolts and screws and fasteners and um, you can get longer trays. Um, you've got your electronic bits, you know, anything, whatever, if you're a sewer, you've got your threads, you, you can use it to store any small parts at all. That's a good I've one. I've got a several of several ones that are sort of similar to that, older. They're, they're not as quite as functional. Uh -huh. What happened? Um, I, we use them in my household for this game, HeroScape. Uh huh. This is a very fun uh, board game that my kids like to play. They're getting a little bit old for it now, but HeroScape's an amazing uh, board game where you you build this big terrain, and then you have all these little figures that are from different myths and, and uh, moments in history. So you can have samurais fighting robots, fighting aliens, uh -huh. fighting secret agents, fighting cowboys. And so there's a million pieces, and you can buy all these expansion packs. There's a million billion of these tiny little figurines. And I finally decided that I couldn't keep them in cardboard box anymore, so I started buying some of these. Yeah, yeah. Been great, but what they, what they don't do is what yours does is being able to take out that individual yeah. modules and move them. That would be very that, useful. That's the whole key. That's the real brilliance of these. Uh, yeah, you could probably use them for storing your Lego parts, too. Exactly. Well, my daughter Zoe just told me that she uses that same case uh, at high school for her uh, stagecraft uh, yeah. class, that they use them in school a lot, and she re thinks they're great, too. So. Yeah. Cool. All right, so uh, I think it's my turn, and so uh, the thing I want to talk about is this. Uh, <laughs> this is a great thing, and it's like, 
It's like ten dollars on Amazon, and it does so much. It's called the LED Bino Head Magnifier. Let me. I need to. Uh, adjust I'm buying this right now. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. buying it. I'm, I'm clicking <laughs> Add to Cart. I don't. I don't uh, need it, but I just want to use wear it because it looks good. <laughs> it fits on your head like this, and it's got. Do you remember Toy Story Two when that guy <laughs> yeah, was like right. painting yeah. me at all? Those, it's got like. Double lens. It's got two sets of lenses here, wow. and then you can put this down, and then it also uh, lights up. <laughs> and you can see wow. this stuff. And uh, it it is amazingly useful. I uh, that the uh, two things that I, I used most recently was that uh, I got a a new uh, MacBook Air for my wife and the cats. There is something about the power cord that the cats love the texture or the taste or the the tooth of it. And they just keep biting it. And you can see this is like where I've been trying oh to like shrink. You can see a hole all the way through. I keep on putting uh, soldering it and putting heat shrink tubing. They just bite through it over and over again. So every time I patch it again, I put these on and solder, and it's great. And then so the Mark, other you time, should, you should cover the thing with something disgusting that they hate, with some kind of you know, really bad smelling uh, duct tape or something. That's well. And cats, actually, are, cats are not meant for human cohabitation. They that's aren't. what dogs are for. <laughs> yeah. Cats are I, just, they're waiting for you to die to eat you. Yeah. <laughs> I've decided that yeah. I love cats in nature. Or I love animals <laughs> in nature. I don't like animals in, in houses. Yeah. Um, and so the other thing that I used it for was, so, so I have the cats destroying the humans things. Then my daughter was like playing with, we got a cat bed with a little ball that hangs from a piece of elastic and my daughter yanked it off. So she was like kind of revenge in a way. She, but I used it to thread the needle and then wear those when I was sewing the, the elastic strap back onto the little cat ball. And it's a great, so the, it's called the, uh, the bi, uh, illuminated multi-power LED bino head magnifier. And I'll be reviewing it on cool tools pretty soon. Yeah. What I a great it, deal. I think it should be called a, I think it should be called a Tom Swift uh you know head magnifier, right? I mean it, you, you need you need you need to add another label there. <laughs> yeah. It's in the future, right? Yeah, definitely. I agree. I think it should be called the chick magnet. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the other guy who wears that. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Do you wear that in public? That <laughs> yeah. So uh let's see. I think um I I think it's uh, Mike's turn now. How about the WD TV Live Plus? So this is a, a, a piece of electronics uh, that uh, I, I got in my house, and as I've started to try and want to move away from uh, uh, having physical media in my house, several years ago I ripped all my MP3s, and the cool feature about this is it will play your if you rip your DVDs to files and store them on a network drive. This box will let you watch the DVDs off a network drive without having to convert them into MP4s or some other format, where you retain all the functionality of the DVD. So you know you follow the DVD menus and all that kind of stuff. So you know I'm not I'm not even halfway done with our DVDs, but I have over 250 DVDs on our drive, and we can watch them on a TV set. Mm. So this box just plugs into the TV set through the HDMI. Uh, you can either have wired or wireless internet connectivity. And then besides doing any kind of media you would have in your house, uh, including DVDs, it also has like Netflix app and mm. Amazon app on it. So if you subscribe to those services, you can watch your uh, um, you can watch your shows through this little box. So you don't need uh, a, a full computer or you know something tied to a specific uh, uh, application ecosystem like the Apple TV is great but it's really tightly tied to Apple and what they'd like you to see and the Western Digital Box is a little more open on the apps it can run and the kind of media you can watch on it so I, I think it's really neat if you're considering you have a big DVD library and you want to kind of turn it into files this is definitely a, a cool tool to uh, watch your DVDs off of files so you can get all that plastic out of your house so I, I'm I'm curious about this because I sort I sort of gave up buying DVDs, you know, almost ten years ago. As soon as Netflix began, and um, I'm just wondering um, about, about the whole idea of wanting to have your own DVDs. Do you do you find that the kinds of ones that you're saving are not available on uh, other places, or I mean, t tell me, tell me, a bit, c convince me that this is a good idea to, to to actually be archiving your own DVDs. 
Um, well, you know, I, uh, I I haven't really bought a lot of DVDs or Blu-ray uh, in the last couple of years, mainly because of all the electronic sell-through stuff you can get. But I, uh, for years, and I worked in television, still work in television, uh, we consume a lot of content, and buying DVDs is usually a pretty good value. Um, and so I have hundreds of DVDs of movies that our family likes. Um, and the truth is, while Netflix and Hulu and Vudu and some of these, they do offer a lot of stuff, Sometimes you just can't find something you want to watch that you have on the DVD. And if it's a, an, a movie from years ago that may be a favorite, a Fifth Element or a Hudson mm-hmm. Hawk or something that is kind of, uh, you, you like to watch it over and over, um, and you know you have the DVD, uh, you know, we're a bit lazy these days with digital media. I love that I can sit in my bed, hit a remote control, and call up a list of whatever DVD I want. I don't have to go up front and spin around a carousel looking for the right DVD and, and, and do it. Um, probably the need for this is going to evaporate over the years. Uh, mm-hmm. Once the libraries, when you can have really access to anything if you're willing to pay whatever that subscription mm-hmm. level is. Mm-hmm. But, but right now, you know, I'm sure if you went to Netflix and you look for the five movies you'd like to see the most, some of them aren't going to be available just because mm-hmm. of the licensing licensing deals aren't there so Mm -hmm. with this our favorite movies the family favorites uh, the children's movies things like that um, that we want to keep and be able to watch whenever we want uh, they're right there so uh, we we really it's kind of going to solve a problem for a short amount of time until kind Mm -hmm. of I think media gets to Mm -hmm. you can subscribe to everything Mm -hmm. but we're just not there yet Mm -hmm. and when you think of the hundreds of hours we all spent digitizing our CD collections uh, which was for several years was a great idea, and now you know it's all on Spotify. You know, I yeah. sort of feel like an idiot for having done it, but during those years, I'm glad that I had it. I guess. <laughs> or even even Amazon now just offered you a, a free, a ripped version of anything you bought on yeah. any music you bought there. They. Yeah. Um, I got up the other morning, and there were 31 yeah. albums. It, I got an email. You have yeah. 31 albums in your Amazon <laughs> cloud. It was awesome. Yeah. 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 So maybe maybe they'll 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 do the same thing with all the movies you've bought from them. They'll say here here they are. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a service uh, through uh, Walmart. If you bring your DVDs to Walmart, they will va- validate you have the physical DVD. Mm-hmm. And then I think for five dollars a DVD, they will then get you a ultraviolet DRM secure digital version of it to watch. Um, I didn't really want to kind of go from one version of DRM to another version of DRM <laughs> and spend $5 per DVD. Uh-huh. But I, I think you're right, Kevin. It, we are heading in the area of where people are going to have access to all their content across platforms. Yeah, no, the, the thing about Netflix, as we all have noticed, is that there will be things on Netflix for years and then, then suddenly they're gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's really peculiar. I don't know what the behind the scenes licensing deals are but um, it's kind of like Costco like you're never sure if you ever see it again yep. yeah yeah it's it's odd yeah so uh, so Kevin did you have something you wanted to mention another well, thing yeah the the um, it's, it's a little thing and actually um, um, it's kind of a variant of something that's very not that's fairly common so this was given to me by um, John Gilmore it's a photon light which um, has been around for a long time, and um, the 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 idea here is is that um, like these little tiny key ring lights, but this one is different in the sense that it's really really bright, and um, it, you know it's just like it's like blindingly <laughs> bright, and um, it, it also um, uh, Wait, we gotta we gotta do that funnier. Shine it again, and all three of us will go flying up. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> um, there, you can get a lot of these guys in made. In fact, I, I, you can get the the made in China versions. You know, for like a dollar a piece or something, and they send it to you by mail from China. Uh, and you know, I give them out to everybody in our family who needs one. But this one is just so much brighter and um, easier to use that. Um, uh, and, and also it has other. I think if you hold it down, you can you, you can get different um, intensities. You can you can adjust the intensity. You can um, make it flash. Uh, um, you know, here's. I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to just do this again. You, you hold it down, and it gets brighter and brighter slowly mm-hmm. and slowly. So, so you can you can adjust the intensity. You can also just make it um, um, 
uh, have different. You can make it flash, although I can't remember how to do that. And so this is just. I, I always carry one of these around because this is almost as bright as any kind of old style flashlight, and I carry it in my pocket all the time. And I use these things all the time, looking for stuff under the, um, you know, under the desk, uh, getting from the car. So it's one of those kinds of things that it's what they call everyday carry. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's in my pocket all the time. And like the um, little knife, the little pen knife, I, I use this an amazing amount of times. I w you would never think about it, but if you, it's kind of like what you were doing with your headlight set, Mark, right? Mm -hmm. A little extra light is amazingly powerful. And this is uh, this yeah. is just a better keychain light than most. That looks good. Yeah, it beats using your your mobile phone screen to as a flashlight, yeah. which is what I often do. Um, okay, well, uh, uh, let's see. We've got. Uh, it, it looks like Michael, you're up again with something that's near and dear to my heart: the Snark ukulele tuner. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this has uh, been covered before on Cool Tools. And uh, also on uh, talked about on Gweek, but uh, we were going to show it again. So it's a small tuner that goes on the top of your ukulele. And I don't know if the camera can get this. Yeah, we can see it. And if you strike a tone, it'll tell you how close you are to a specific uh, uh, chord or uh, string for tuning. So my daughter has been very into ukuleles. Uh, uh, she's up to, I think, three of them now, the latest being at Christmas. She got a compact portable ukulele that's even smaller than a standard ukulele. But she really loves this uh, tuner from Snark. And uh, she says it's the best, and I think they're like under $10. I mean, it's it's they're $11 Pretty on amazing. Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So it's very yeah. visual. It's very easy. She loves it. It uh, doesn't require any kind of college degree to use it. And mm -hmm. uh, if you're into into ukuleles, uh, it's it's meant for ukuleles. It's not a guitar tuner. So um, for all the ukulele fans, get one. Although they do have guitar versions, but they, yes. they, have, they have ones for specifically for ukuleles. And also, as I noticed, and this is true, my wife has one too. Um, you just it's light enough that you just keep it permanently sna uh, attached on. I mean, you you don't even bother taking it off because it's yeah. mm -hmm. it's light enough just to just to leave on all the time. Yeah, we really have four good. of them in our household. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we just we can't have enough snarks. In it. <laughs> yes, everybody wants one all the time. We're all perfectly in tune at all times. That's good. And yeah. ukuleles are hard to tune, I think. And so you really do need something like this. They're very sensitive to to tuning. And and uh, Michael, you don't happen to have that miniature ukulele in the room there. I'd like to take a look at it. Why don't you uh, Why don't you guys keep talking? I'll go get okay. it. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, so I, I just briefly will talk about mine. Uh, this is called a uh, the Zoom Slim Vision uh, Reading Glass, and it's uh, it's all plastic. It's very uh, thin profile, and they cost ten dollars. Um, and so what I like about them is just that they're very compact. So I keep them. Uh, I keep one in my little travel case uh, that when I travel, so that I always have one. And uh, there's there's nothing too remarkable about them other than they're extraordinarily lightweight and and for ten dollars inexpensive. Um, and they and, come in uh, kind of they come in standard prescriptions or is, is, yeah. is that the idea? You they just, go you from, don't, right. They go from uh, you know like I have uh, one that's uh, one point two five. I think they go up to three, and uh, they're just great. Uh, uh, so you know, it's a, I keep them in my pocket for reading menus, everything that people would normally do with reading glasses. But I just like the size and the super lightweightness of them, make them uh, my reading glasses of choice. Well, what about for nearsightedness? What about for um, distant? They don't. I don't think they do. I okay. think you need a prescription to get nearsightedness glasses, mm -hmm. don't you? Or, or you need you need to spec it out. I don't know. I don't think they do. But um, oh, so you have your uh, the ukulele here. Michael. Yes, so uh, this is the oh, wow. oh. So it was uh, my daughter found it on Etsy, handmade by a guy, and so we got it just the day before Christmas to give to her. Cool. So uh, I, I'm not a player, so I can't uh -huh. really play anything. But uh, I'll, I'll put bring the other one up in comparison. So let me step back a bit. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And so it's got the. Uh, it actually looks like it's. Uh, 
the the bridge to nut length is 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 longer, so it's it's probably like a concert length. Uh, sure, I, I don't know ukuleles, <laughs> yeah. but uh, my daughter loves it. Um, it's really cool. One of the it's strings beautiful. broke, so she's mm-hmm. we're gonna go get another string to replace it. Is that a is that a, is that a jack on the side for yeah, electrification? There's, there's, a, there's a jack on the side there. Oh, okay. It reminds me a little bit of those Lug guitars that um, yeah. There's, there's a Kickstarter campaign for them, and my son and I got backed him and got one and built it. And it wasn't quite. You don't tune it the same way you do a ukulele, but it's it's more that size than it is a standard ukulele size. And also very fun. Um, but that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, well, the guy who built it was really nice to us, uh, got it here on time for Christmas, uh, and each one's handmade, and you can't really tell, but the wood is inlaid. It's it's beautifully done, and I think it was around $150, which oh is... Uh, Could you show me what the tuners look like on the, the tuning? Is it... So there's see. a special tool. So you can't really uh-huh. turn it there's, as much with your hand. It's right. like there's no there's no thumb wings. You've got to, you've got to use a little wrench to to yeah. tune it. Yeah. And and just to descri- I'll, I'll describe this for the benefit of people who may not be seeing this. It's sort of looks like a great big torpedo. It's kind of long and thin, and looks more like a zucchini <laughs> than anything else. A kind of big zucchini. It uh, looks to me like one of those paddles that fraternities used to hit each other with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's so some, imagine something very, very oblong and long uh, without the normal curves that you would associate with a guitar or ukulele. And you can't feel it, but it's very solid wood. It's not like, like I could put my thumb through a, a ukulele. It's such thin wood. This is, this is solid, so for traveling, it's not going to really get damaged. Mm-hmm. You may have to you know, adjust the string or move the bridge a little bit to get it back to where you want it, but it's rugged for travel. And there is a hand-sewn case that also uh, we got with it uh, for carrying along. So uh, I think it's really intended for taking it on the road on a, a bit of a rough trip, but still want to bring your music with you. So, so I'm going to ask you for the the URL for that, so I can add it to the show notes on the on the Cool Tools post about this, Mike. Okay, cause that's that's really cool. Yeah. I like it, it. So we're we're running up against our our hour. But Josh, uh, we have time for one more review, and I, I think these two things you wanted to talk about are related. Uh, something that your sons are using: the Piranha Gear 10 ounce boxing gloves and a training bag that goes along with it. I imagine. Yeah. So my sons are 15 and 12, and they wanted, um, you know, a, a punching bag and some boxing gloves for working out their aggressions against me. On, I'm sure. <laughs> and. Uh, so I did some research into it, and, and there's a lot of um, boxing gear f- made for kids and marketed for kids. But the more I read about it, the more it seemed like they weren't really very safe they, and very durable. They tend to break easily, and um, you know the the kids ones are made out of cheap you know vinyl. And they, and as I remember having them when I was a kid, that the vinyl gets ripped and torn and has sharp edges and hurts you when if you punch your brother with it. So. Uh, <laughs> The advice that I got and that I followed was to get um, small, you know, adult bo- boxing gloves, maybe even women's boxing gloves. So these 10 ounce um, boxing gloves are are very small. Uh, I don't think they would fit me, but they're perfect for a uh, you know a 12 year old or a 15 year old. And they're real boxing gloves. So they're leather and they're and they're uh, durable and they're they're really nice. And then this training bag is called the Century Original Wave Master Training Bag. I didn't want to mount a boxing, a punching bag in our house anywhere. I mean, I guess I could do it on one of the ceiling beams in the basement or something, but the kids don't really use the basement, and I feel like it would just go to waste down there, and they would, it wouldn't be, there would be no point of having bought it in the first place. So I wanted it to be upstairs, but I didn't want to have to mount it on the wall or the ceiling. So they needed something that was freestanding, and they wanted something adjustable, because as they grow, they're going to want to hit things that are higher and higher. And uh, so I did, again, did some uh, research, and this Century Original Wave Master Training Bag is really neat because you fill the base with water. Or I, I've heard you can also fill it with sand, but I think it's a real pain to unfill it again, whereas the water you can unfill with, like, a, a waterbed um, a little pump to uh, pump out the water. But, yeah, so you can set it up anywhere in the house and then just pump water into it, and it, it's extremely heavy, and you can you can barely sh- shift it once it's full. And then it's, it's also the... Uh, the kind of neck is adjustable, so you can make the bag uh, go pretty high. So um, it's been fantastic, and um, it hasn't caused any problems, and they haven't hurt themselves, and they haven't broken it yet, and they've, and they've tried to break it as much as they could. And they've, they've misused it, and they've sat on it, and they've stood on it, and, the, and their friends have climbed to the top of it, and it seems quite durable, so I'm very pleased with it. 
That that truly really seems great. The uh, the punching bag. I'm wondering about the gloves. Um, there was a couple other alternatives. The the Everlast Youth boxing gloves. Yeah. I was just wondering how the, how the Piranha compared to other comparables. Right. So obviously I didn't buy any other ones but these. But um, based on reviews that I've read online uh -huh. and things that people have told me. Um, even Everlast, often the, the children's boxing gloves just aren't really very high quality. They're not really, like a lot of things made for kids, they're not meant to last forever. You're mm -hmm. supposed to be able to get a year out of them or six months or whatever, and they figure you'll all grow them or break them by then anyway. So I didn't, I didn't want that, um, partly for the reason, as I said before, that cheap gloves that are made, they have kind of vinyl instead of leather, they, you know, they rip and then they have these sharp edges on them. Okay. So um, I wanted something a little higher quality. So this is a uh, this is a women's or a small version of adult. Yeah. yeah, I think these are. I didn't tell my sons, but I think these are women's boxing gloves. That I bought. <laughs> and uh, they have really good wrist support. Um, the women who use them uh, uh, reported on Amazon that that the wrist support is excellent on these, which is also important for growing boys. So I was yeah. happy about that. That's great. Well, you guys, that's uh, going to wrap up the very first Cool Tools podcast. I, I think it went really well. Um, to uh, to find out, to get links to all of these, uh, that, everything that we talked about, go to kk.org and then click on Cool Tools, and then you can go to the Cool Tools website and, and find out about all of this. I'll also have uh, the recorded version of this podcast up so that you can share it with your friends. Um, uh, Joshua, uh, Michael, and Kevin, it was it was great chatting with you guys. It was really great, a great experiment for this kind of. I think um, what I'm now thinking of as a show and tell. And by the way, anybody listening, if you have a item that you love, something you use a lot that you want to share with, send us an email um, and tell us about why it's great, and we'll try to make it onto the site. Yeah, uh, send an email to editor at kk.org, and we'll get it. Yeah. And, Kevin, I think that's a good idea. We should call this the Cool Tools Show and Tell podcast. podcast right. That's so good. We just, we just discovered something. That's fantastic. <laughs> we did. Like we it. learned something. Like <laughs> and, and so thanks, you guys. Thanks so much, Michael. Sure thing, guys. Great. Okay, you guys. Thanks. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you guys. Have Bye, a good yeah, afternoon. Nice. You too. Bye, guys. Reggaeton de corazón. Reggaeton de corazón.